Hello. In this lecture, we will be looking at the 16th century in Northern Europe, specifically at what had been the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Germany, Austria, um, and France. Now, we're going to talk about how the Renaissance was influential on this region um, through the, the work of a few painters, um, and then we'll look at a couple of examples of French architecture of the 16th century. Now, the Renaissance in Italy was a, a very powerful humanist movement with a focus on realism and technique. At the tail end of the Renaissance, just, just at the, in Italy, there was a, a, a mannerist movement um, that we've discussed in another lecture. But in the North, there was a backlash against um, the, what was seen as the overindulgent humanism of Italy, and that was spreading through the church. And uh, so in the North, there, there really was more of an emphasis on morality um, and on a, a more... Um, personal responsibility and accountability, not, not necessarily to the church, but to faith and to each other. Um, and that was expressed through the art in a variety of ways. The aesthetic of the Holy Roman Empire was this personal responsibility as an expression of beauty. So what made uh, an image or uh, beautiful or what made an idea or concept beautiful was that it reflected this social responsibility. So you have a responsibility to the group and to society at large, but also a responsibility to yourself, to your family, to each other in your relationships. And that found an expression in both religious subject matter and in some more su secular subject matter. Now, in terms of style, and technique, we, we see some of the influence of a, a strong sense of realism um, that filters to, into the North um, through a couple of most notable artists. Albrecht Dürer, in particular, is quite often held as uh, one of the most important Northern artists in this sense of bringing the strong sense of realism uh, and classical realism to the North, because he's one of the few artists from the North who actually traveled to Italy to f experience the Renaissance firsthand and brought back that, that uh, style and realism. Now, in the time period, there was also some, uh, some changes that focused on uh, different forms of art, different media, um, we're going to see the rise of printmaking as a very important art form. We're going to see uh, the rise of altar pieces, uh, which had been around for a, a period of time, but were relatively new things. And altar pieces were uh, important because they allowed uh, not only the artists to um, add to pre-existing structures, pre-existing um, cathedrals and buildings that had been around since the Gothic or before, but also um, these altarpieces could reflect some of the changes seasonally. So they, they could be opened or closed, they could have multiple panels, and, um, and so it, it gave a little bit more flexibility to, to the church and to individuals who wanted um, their, their decorative taste to change seasonally perhaps. So we'll look first at uh, what's considered a, an early um, and masterpiece of the Holy Roman Empire period in the 16th century. It's, a, it's called the Eisenheim Altarpiece by Matthias Grunwald. Now Grunwald is a, an important artist because he represents um, really this shift away from what had been kind of the Gothic style of the North, towards a more Renaissance-influenced style. And he also shows how the, uh, the artists of the North um, put their own kind of stamp on the Renaissance. 
One of the things that uh, is very common in Northern Renaissance or Holy Roman Empire works is the inclusion of text. So because more and more the populace is literate and because um, text allows the artist not only to express himself visually, but to make very specific references. So you start to see textual elements incorporated, a uh, little, um, you know, text boxes that relate to or communicate directly the story, especially if the story is something historical or if it's something that uh, is not common knowledge in, uh, for the people who, who would be viewing these works. Um, now, even when the works were you know, relatively common, there was uh, often incorporation of text as an element into the design of the painting. Now, in this case, the Eisenheim altarpiece is a shaped altarpiece that was designed um, as both a painting and kind of a, a almost a piece of furniture that could be, it had multiple panels, and we'll look at those in a minute, um, based upon the liturgical year. So here we have uh, what would be a common scene around Easter time, um, Christ on the cross. We see then him... Uh, in Lamentation, he's taken down from the cross in the lower panel and then flanked on either side by martyrs and saints um, that were specific to the church where this, that this was created for. The style reflects both the Renaissance level of realism, of light and dark, and light against dark, uh, influence, influenced specifically by uh, Leonardo, but also the more uh, typical kind of German style of um, very stark figures um, trying to really emote out of the viewer a, or elicit from the viewer a dramatic response. Um, so the figures are very grotesque. Um, and you, know, you see that in Christ's body and how it looks um, very, very um, stretched on the cross and his hands are curled and his muscles are tense and he's very gaunt and thin. And all of that is intended to elicit that specific uh, response of the viewer to feel uh, a, a real dramatic sense of loss um, and, and of shame almost. It's a, a kind of a, a, a different view of looking at the role of Christians in the 16th century and the role that they uh, and how they relate to their faith. Christians are supposed to be, um, you know, duly shameful based upon their sin. And that's sin is a theme throughout the work of these figures uh, or these artists. I mean, now on the interior of the altarpiece, another common theme we'll see is not only is it painted, but there's also sculpted elements. Um, these sculpted elements show a relief. They're most often like this one carved from wood uh, that's been either gilded or um, or decorated and painted. And we see that uh, here we see a combination of Renaissance style of realism and level of realism. But in addition, we see the, the, the older traditions, the German traditions of carving and uh, of the use of kind of a, a, a shallow space, a flatter background. Um, that was becoming less and less common in Italian Renaissance works. But overall, the themes are still pretty typical religious. They are, um, they're, they're not shying away from church doctrine, although at this point, we're starting to see the beginnings of a rumbling in Northern Europe uh, that what will become the Protestant Reformation and they are unhappy, really, with what they see as the excess of the church in Italy, what they see as being the, um, the indulgence, the overindulgence of the wealthy and, and uh, it not a, a fair or legitimate um, view of how, the, uh, uh, of how sin is, a, is supposed to be um, you know, resolved through the believer. And we see that much more strongly. We see uh, a lot of imagery of demons, a lot of imagery of what happens if, with the results of sin, uh, imagery of judgment, um, very common Northern Renaissance themes as we build up to and, and beyond the Protestant Reformation.
So this is an example of what the or a photo that shows you what the altarpiece would have looked like uh, actually in the church. Um, multiple panels opened and closed. Um, that way they could be changed out in relief depending upon the season, depending upon the uh, the um, the desire of the the uh, leaders of the church itself. Now you also notice that this is placed in a church that is relatively Romanesque. It's relatively austere in its uh, overall decoration, and that was one of the goals of, of well, the reason why they made these altarpieces was to add all these decorative elements to um, to these churches that were, that were lacking in them. So overall, the idea behind these works is to show the, the importance of faith and of personal accountability, of morality, of, um, you know, all of these elements to, to society and how society was a reflection of either the, the lack of those those moral elements or the the degradation of them, and that's ultimately what um, what what the artists of the North were really focusing on. They saw that society was no longer reflecting what they considered to be traditional Christian and and uh, religious values, and that the church was not enforcing these values um, consistently. Uh, across the levels of society, uh, and even within the church itself, there was a great deal of corruption. There was a great deal of um, of what was seen as um, kind of division and divisiveness. Uh, so here, Grunwald gives us an image of what he sees as the hierarchy of the church, um, kind of similar to what we saw at the tail end of the Renaissance, a, a pretty typical scene of um, of church hierarchy with the division between uh, the earthly realm and the heavenly realm. Although unlike typical, more it, it seems from Italy like perhaps Raphael's disputation of the sacrament, what we see here is the an image that shows a, a, a much more organized um, view of both the earth, of the hierarchy of the earth and, um, and the heavens. That uh, you know, in the heavens, Christ is still depicted as crucified, which is interesting because they want to really focus on that element. They want to make sure that everybody sees the crucifixion, um, because you know that's what's really going to inspire the viewer to you know believe that it's only through belief in Christ, and it's only because of Christ's sacrifice. Sacrifice is another recurring theme that it requires sac sacrifice on our part because uh, in today's world, because Christ sacrificed first for us. Now, we also see the richness of, and this was not lost on the people, the richness of the fabrics and the, and the crowns and those things worn by the leaders of the church in juxtaposition of the simplicity of the, the dress worn by both the saints in heaven and the people here on earth. And this was another element that led to the Re Reformation. Pe people in the North were, uh, you know, and rightfully so, saw that and believed that if you were wealthy, that you were kind of allowed to get away with things that perhaps uh, if you, the, the poor were not. And the church, uh, not only did it embrace this attitude, it was a part of it, that, that, that many of the, church, the most important church leaders, especially in Rome and, and in Italy, they were very themselves very wealthy and lived very uh, lavishly. And that was seen as antithetical to what church doctrine really ought to be. Now, the... As I mentioned, the most important of the figures of the, the Northern Renaissance is, is really Albrecht Dürer. Dürer is most known or notable, I suppose, for his printmaking. Um, he was a master printmaker at a time when printmaking was not, um, was really just beginning in its, uh, in its practices. Um, he he was an etcher, and these were etchings that made on metal plates. 
uh, by scratching and carving into the surface the lines and forms, uh, and then inking the plates and then printing those plates uh, to create multiple prints of the um, of the scene, and those could then be sold in additions. And what that did was it allowed for a much wider audience for his works. Um, and so printmaking is in itself a bit more egalitarian uh, art form because it's not about a single work that only the wealthy could collect or uh, if the, the um, it had to be on public display like in a church for the um, for the the poor or lower classes to have any any chance of experiencing it. So these works, while they weren't um, as expensive as paintings, they were still um, really more targeted towards those with enough wealth, enough uh, um, you know income to uh, collect. And so because um, they were not, you know, they were still relatively uh, expensive based upon. Uh, the average uh, salary of the you know of the individual household, but because they were more um, you know more accessible, Durer, that allowed Durer to have a greater uh, kind of audience uh, to a, a greater platform for his message. Durer's message is always going to be one of that personal responsibility. He chooses as a subject matter often religious scenes, but sometimes more allegorical, more classical scenes, um, but almost always scenes that focus on the, the result of dis the decisions of free will. So here we have Adam and Eve, um, and we see he chooses to cast Adam and Eve as these classical figures. They're very muscular, they show contrapposto, um, they are very much the, in that classical figure tradition but he also, um, you know, makes them into uh, the the typical scene of free will and of original sin. He, uh, you know, the the doctrinal scene from the church. He wants people to understand that sin is the result of our free will. We can choose to sin or choose not to, and if we choose not to, then we're following Christ, regardless of what the church says. And that's an important point for um, for Durer, because he's a, a devout Catholic, and he believes very strongly in the power of the message of, of religious art. But at the same time, um, he sees that within the church, there is uh, that the, that message has gotten muddled, it's gotten lost, and he wants to bring it back. And he doesn't want to bring it back just for the upper classes and the wealthy, he wants to bring it back for everyone. Now, so scenes like these would have been printed multiple times, and then um, they were collected in leafs and portfolios, and they would often um, be incorporated, not necessarily into religious text, like an illustration or an illumination from a manuscript would have been in previous generations, but they would have had the same effect. So really, this is the legacy of those illuminations, just taken out of the context of a, a Psalter or a Bible and put into really just more of a specific art um, manifestation. Now, as a painter, Durer learned a great deal from what he saw in uh, in Italy. He learned a lot from the Renaissance artists, and he, he actually visited Italy at the same time as Mannerism. And so he's learning from artists like Pontormo, like uh, Tintoretto, uh, La, La Correggio, how to... Um, organize a scene, how to use color, how to use light, how to use space. And he's also learning from the previous generation, the Leonardo, uh, about how to use atmosphere and depth to create uh, his imagery. So here, typical Christian scene, Christ taken down from the cross. And of course, you've also got the elements of the patrons in the corner, those little figures down there, those are the patrons. Um, and you have the 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 point of the message of the imagery is ultimately 
focused on the suffering of Christ. Uh, that's why the crown of thorns is included. That's why the shroud is included. That's why they're lamenting his death. But also, he, he really wants to set it in his contemporary time. They're dressed like they lived in his time. Uh, we see the background, uh, a that 16th century city from his time. This is not trying to be realistic or um, accurate to the story so much as it is trying to be meaningful to the people of his own time. This is one of Durer's most famous and enduring works. Um, it's called The Night, Death, and the Devil. And it is a, an allegorical work, and it's intended to speak directly to the people of Durer's time. He wants to, um, you know, this is still the age of, to a certain extent, of chivalry, the age of, uh, you know, feudalism basically has passed, but everyone knows who and what the knights are and were. They, they knight, the role of a knight had changed and they're, they're no longer uh, the same, uh, playing the same role, but the idea, the concept of a uh, an important uh, chivalrous figure and that man should endeavor to be that. That, you know, the knight in this case is really more representative of all of man and that we're supposed to act like knights. The, the best, most positive elements of society should be reflected in us. And so here you have this strong, upright knight uh, who's in his full battle and armor array and he's on his horse and he's focused and directed and on either side uh, he's surrounded by the death by death and the devil and he pays them no mind you know because the goal here for him is to uh, for the night is to focus on his journey his path his uh, his responsibility and he has the the skull at the foot of his horse to represent you know what sometimes the sacrifice of being chivalrous means you know might mean death um, he has the dog representing fidelity and loyalty that travels with him um, and he's always being tempted you know tempted to turn away from his path because of death to tempt it or that what another path that might lead to uh, a, a shameful death a sinful death and he's always being tormented and followed by demons and the devil because that could you know the, the devil's trying to get him to turn away from that path of righteousness images like this and the symbolism included in them were very important to uh, to the 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 role of art the artists of the north believed that uh, their return to classicism, their renaissance, was not just about style, it was also about message. That they were, they were going back to an, uh, a, a view of art as the ability to manipulate the viewer into thinking, believing, or acting a certain way. And in order to do that, you had to uh, be very clear about your message. And we see that very strongly in Durer's work. Now, in France, it's a slightly different take. This is the beginning of the end of the relationship, not only if, uh, because of the Reformation of the North with the, the connection with the church, but it's also the, the beginning of, the, of a moving away from the church for France. Most notably, we see the, uh, the imagery of the relationship between the rest of Europe and Henry VIII, uh, in the works of Hans Holbein. Now, Holbein was a court painter, and Holbein um, was most uh, importantly a, a portraitist. You know, that's ultimately what he was most known for was his, uh, his portraits, whether they be single or double. Um, in this case, this is his portrait of the French ambassadors. Now, you see here all of the different objects that surround them, and they're a big part of the scene. They're, they're telling, they're symbolic. The references to various cultures, to various uh, elements of learning, of science, of knowledge. Um, we see how they're dressed as, you know, to mark them as um, important figures. They wear the, 
the crest of the king. They wear the around his neck on that medal. They wear the the cloaks of of royalty or of, of the courtliness. Um, they're they are worldly, but there's also an element here of uh, symbolism. There's an there's a an image that dragged across or seems to be very much out of place across the the bottom of the scene there. And you don't know exactly what that object is when you look at the painting directly. It's not until you look at the painting at an angle, a very specific angle, that you see that it's a skull. So when you tilt the painting on its side um, and you and you see it from that very strong perspective, you see that skull at their feet. Now, the reason why he included this um, is that this painting was made like many to be viewed or well to be installed in a position where it would it would be viewed from uh, an angle when you walked up a staircase. So the paintings in the in the time period were very often made to be placed uh, in stairwells along in these big you know manor houses, big palaces, big homes. And so as such, they would very often include, you know, you, as you walked up the stairs, you would get a different view of the painting. And so it's not until you, you view the painting from that angle that you see that skull. This is a symbolic reference to the nature of being an ambassador. Ambassadors, unfortunately for them, were very often that they were at court at the other, um, you know, at another king's court. So... An ambassador would be sent to uh, another king's court, and they would live at that, not at court, but they would very regularly um, attend court to represent that country, that other country in, uh, in that kingdom. So in France, there would be ambassadors from Austria and Germany and Italy and everywhere else, and the French would send ambassadors. And the, the reason why uh, this, he includes the skull is because Sometimes it uh, was not unheard of for ambassadors when they, you know, when it was the two countries uh, were at war with each other to be killed before they could escape. The ambassadors were politicians, but they also very often were seen kind of as spies in their midst uh, to be learned from, and they would use their position to learn um, what they could borrow or steal from. Uh, their king from that court that they lived at, uh, and then that was, um, so that made their role very tenuous, and because of that, they they would often lose their lives as a result of their their role. It was a dangerous, dangerous job, and that's a you know so in Holbein's work tends to be much more secular. We do see some religious work by Holbein, but much of it is very nationalistic. So even when there's a Madonna and Child, there's a strong sense of nationalistic pride in Holbein's work. And, you know, he he was very much a courtly painter. He he's a, it works for um, the king, and as such, he wants to show images of the pride of his country. And so here we see no attempt really to set the scene in accuracy. It's it's much more about this message of pride in place and pride in nation. The Marian is depicted in the dress of a queen um, rather than as you know who she was, and she's flanked on either side by a bishop and by a knight representing the the important. Uh, elements of the church and the role of the church in contemporary society. This is one of Holbein's most famous paintings. It's a famous portrait, uh, standing portrait of Henry VIII. And this is a, a traditional um, portrait of uh, that would be very common in uh, would become very common in Europe. The uh, the the kingly portrait, the royal portrait, many would be made, um, not necessarily always annually, but very often annually. Uh, and the idea was to document and record uh, 
the king, of course, to show him as uh, as stately, as leader, but also to show off the wealth and power and independence. And so here, you know, when when Holbein paints Henry VIII, this is very much at the point where he's uh, he's pulling away from and and the the church in Rome. He's setting himself up as uh, separate as outside the church. He wants to become like the old Roman Empire emperors. He wants to be both the political leader and the religious leader. And so really, ultimately, he creates what's called the Anglican Church, the Church of England, uh, as separate from the Catholic Church. Because he sees, uh, he, he does not want to, uh, you know, that threat to his sovereignty, that threat to his rule. Um, it, he's depicted in the you know common scene of the day, or common dress of the day for the king, um, very fashionable, very up to date, um, and he's uh, you know he's showing off his his wealth and power, and that's that's what this the pose and posture and the uh, and everything about the scene are intended to depict. We see a strong sense of the realism, the detail that would be common in in Renaissance style, but uh, it's not. Um, it's not quite as um, focused on contrast, say, as the works of uh, Leonardo or the Mannerists. Now, the architecture reflects the, the prosperity of the French and the English and the Germans of the, you know, of the time, the 16th century, 15th, 16th century is a time of great prosperity, but it's also, as we know, a time of exploration. It's the beginning of a spread, a movement in Europe to explore, to colonize, and to exploit the resources of the rest of the world, the global resources. So the Spanish head to South America, the English and French head to North America, the um, and, and Asia and Africa and the Near East and the Middle East and the and Eastern Europe and all of these countries, all of these um, are these colonies are really generating a great deal of wealth through natural resources. That's then coming back to Europe and creating these very very wealthy monarchies. And so as such, they're building new palaces, palaces upon palaces. The most famous examples of these are in France, where the successive Louis build palaces upon palaces in the Chateau de Chambord uh, and the Louvre in Paris are just a reflection of that. So this is a precursor to what will be known as Baroque style, it is, uh, it's not really Baroque, um, it's, it's a beginning of it. It's Baroque in feel, in scale, in, in magnificence, in drama, but it's, it's still in between Renaissance and Baroque. It's, it has classical elements, um, but it's, it's searching for uh, a, this, a new style and we see some of the, the older elements, uh, like we might have seen in the House of Jalcour in the Gothic, uh, with uh, elaborate staircasing, with the use of uh, columns of scroll work. But now we're going to see an even grander scale. Um, you know, the whole point of these palaces was to just show off the excessive wealth of the kings and the, and the nobility, and then to allow them to live a lifestyle that is just, um, you know, the the most extravagant. And this actually is also another element that leads to the division in Europe, the division between what is seen as the excesses of the monarchy and the excesses of the nobility and the, the excesses of the upper class and the wealthy and the, the landed gentry and the realities of life for uh, individuals day to day. But it does certainly make for some grand architecture. You know, these buildings, this is the Louvre in Paris, which is today one of the most important museums in the world. It was originally built uh, as a palace for uh, when Marie de Medici married uh, the Louis, uh, the King of France, Louis the King of France, um, when she first moved to um, 
to France. She, Marie de Medici was the last of the great de Medici family, and she brought with her not only her art collection, which is why there's so much great Renaissance art in the Louvre, but also uh, her wealth, her fortune, which was vast. And so she uh, used that to um, b build and update her, uh, her great palace there. Again, we see some precursors to the Baroque, the Baroque uh, the Baroque dome, the Baroque use of uh, uh, multiple levels and, and surface levels, but it's, it's still just in, in the, the early stages. There's a lot of classical elements here. The caryatids, the attached fig, uh, columns in the shape of uh, female figures that we haven't seen since the Greek um, attached to the facade, the broken pediments, the multiple levels impediments, um, the clocks, which were a, a very important element of the 16th century, very famous, uh, very popular. All of these things really mark the grandeur of what will become the Baroque style of architecture. So what's important about the, the 16th century is that um, we're starting to see a division of style and of aesthetic based upon nationality. We're going to, as we move forward into uh, the Baroque and then on further into uh, the 18th, 17th and 18th century, what we'll see is that art will, um, and, the, and aesthetic will vary based upon traditions and past and history. And we see that beginning very early in Northern Europe in the 16th century. So we'll look at um, all of those transitions in future lectures.